producer's mindset. Now, admittedly, I'm a little bit biased because before the uh, before I started in direct response, I was an event coordinator. I was a pr uh, producer, <laughs> a production manager, things along those lines. So I, I love that term. But it is also the term that, you know, in the midst of putting on, let's say, an event, you, you have your timeline, like, and especially with timelines, an event dead, like, time doesn't change. Once you set that event date, like, you make it. Friday, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to Streamline to Scale. Thank you so much for joining us uh, in this amazing group. Today, we have an incredible speaker, Amber People. Amber Peoples? I, I do know like Amber a little bit because I have a hard time like reading things, but I know I've, I've known Amber for a long time. So excuse me for getting your name wrong. It's, it's okay. Just, I, I, you know, my parents did it right. Actually, they gave me the coolest name, isn't it? And, and if you add, add the middle name, it's Amber May Peoples. Oh, uh, see, like, they did it right. Where it all comes together for you. This <laughs> is why you do what you do when you are who you are. <laughs> When you get it's to true. know Amber Miller, you will understand that both with like her environmental work, but also her marketing work and just everything she does. She is the people connector, the people person, the wrangler of cats, the environmental <laughs> savior. Amber is many things and we love her in this world. Oh, I love you too, Michelle. Oh my goodness. Such an amazing intro. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, now I'm going to read the real intro, everybody. So let's, let's see how well I can get through this. So excuse me today. <laughs> All right, guys. So Amber Peoples is here with us today. Um, she's an incredible friend and marketer. Obviously, I've known her for quite a bit in my career, uh, met originally through Copy Accelerator, uh, hung out at several events. We got to hang poolside after one of the events. We met up in Portland. Like Amber's just a really cool person to, to get to know. So I invited her on today. Um, just to give you, you know, she's going to go over all the things about optimizing sales uh, and your high ticket offer and just a little bit about Amber and her background. Um, after previous careers in education and event production, Amber entered the world of direct response marketing about three years ago with a mission. And that mission is to learn how to reach people with calls to action so that we can fly together farther and faster. Note about this, we're gonna talk at the end of the call because uh, she just gave me a really great quote about this. But also in Amber's earth relationship business, her goal is to share technologies of belonging and connection. And in her marketing business includes the same passion. So as a result, Amber has focused on increasing leverage for impact-driven offer owners. Today, her goal is to impact you with a strategy on more high ticket sales. So let's jump in and do it. Welcome, Amber. Thank you so much for being here. I Thank really you. appreciate it. Oh, I'm so delighted. And I'm so every time that we have a chance to connect, I'm always happy. Uh, and I I oh I will always remember that pool side. I was the, it was the first in-person copy accelerator both of us got to go to because before then they were COVID online. And um and both of us were <laughs> a little bit like this afterwards. <laughs> and and we were poolside and we were like looking at each other as we were typing and then finally we got into the pool and <laughs> it was it was uh, such a good time and 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 then when that picture that you posted yesterday I totally forgot that you took it because <laughs> it was so for those of you who have zero clue about who I am I, I do this amazing thing called a static dance and I had just come from that uh, as Michelle was coming through my town uh, and I brought her to my dear dear friend Deepak Saxena's had just opened a restaurant called Masala Lab. And uh, we went there for brunch and both of us with every bite, we're just like, this is the best thing ever. Uh, and so, yes, uh, I'm, I'm so delighted. And uh, that Michelle had her, was it a year? Were you traveling for like a year? Uh, yeah, a couple years. I lived with my mom for a year and traveled from there for a year. And then it was like wow. one day under the one year mark, I like took off on this road trip and I was just driving around the country for a while, but stopped and, and got to see Amber. Yes, I landed back where I started. I was in search of my home and I realized it was always, my home was always here for start. With, so. Perfect. I love circles. <laughs> <laughs> 
And so, uh, and so, but of course, you are not here to learn about Masala Lab or Circles. You are here to learn about high ticket sales. So let's talk about that. But just kind of know that, you know, when, when when I work with people, this is this is how I roll. Like, I definitely love to really connect with the people that I work with. That's that's important to me. Uh, you know, Michelle mentioned in the intro that that mission driven piece uh, is is so critical for me, and that actually really plays into this high ticket sales approach. Um, and it is a, a strategy approach, uh, listening in on the conversations Michelle has had with Misty Williams. And what was Carla's last name? Carla Sing Song. Thank you, Carla Sing Song. Um, one of the things that I really loved, because they both talked about outsourcing, you know, Carla really focused on that, but Misty talked about that quite a bit as well, and her team um, being outsourced a lot. And um, I think it was Misty who said that, you know, you can hire pretty much everything outsourced, even internationally, except for the strategy plays. The strategy plays you really need to focus on and dial in and 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 invest in, essentially. And so today we're going to talk about a strategy play. Uh, we're going to talk about um, uh, how it is really available to most of you, um, especially. You know, I really thought about throughout as I kind of piece together my thoughts for talking about today. I really thought about, okay, when can I highlight visionaries in this talk and when can I highlight operators? And throughout both uh, throughout this talk, I'll, I'll kind of do that. But right here at the get-go, uh, this is for both. Um, it is that uh, strategic, visioning, creative um, element. It's also very operational um, and a and, uh, step-by-step approach. Uh, and ultimately, also, if you're at that C-suite level that I know you work with, Michelle, it is that piece of really understanding how to use um, both assets and how to minimize your risks. And so I know that C-suite folks um, are, are always looking at that when they're looking at strategy, and, and this piece will, will definitely do that. And so more than likely, if you're here, you've had some fantastic successes um, because um, Michelle uh, is definitely one of those people that draws those people in uh, because she is such a success always in my eyes. Oh, yes, you Aww, are. You are way too kind, girl. You are way too kind. I don't want to interrupt you on this, but yeah. I do want to just mention one of your massive successes. And when I, because you are very much this person too, and you attract this person because you exude it. Like that pool conversation we were talking about earlier. Can you just, can you just give them a glimpse of the deal that you were wrapping <laughs> up while we were on that conversation? Pretty sure it had a little something to do with, yeah. Yeah. How about you go ahead and just. A little something to do with Netflix. Yeah, well, it's nothing to do with that list. Kind of a big deal. <laughs> it was, Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but yeah, I'd love. To. It was, and it, what's fantastic is that um, that deal continues. I continue to actually work on the control for their quiz funnel, uh, which I love. Uh, and we're um, actually talking about some of the things that we're going to talk about today, um, about uh, looking at their back end uh, in a different way uh, that they have been so far. Um, and um, but yeah, it was it was somebody that um, about two months after that pool party uh, had a show uh, that uh, premiered on Netflix, uh, and that person um, it was kind of a reality TV show, and that person ended up actually becoming the main face of the show uh and of the six episodes she was in five of them when most of the other uh folks were um in in two of them and so it was it was an amazing amazing opportunity and and doing incredible work in the world um helping helping people in really vulnerable areas of their lives and it was such a delight um to be part of that team and and to continue to work with them in in um kind of the the circle of of bringing people in uh when they when, especially when they see that show or they hear about it and they go oh that's that's the unique angle I need. And, and of course, that's, you know, a key piece that all of us are looking for is what is that unique angle? Uh, and that does play into this high ticket sale approach as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, full circle on that is really just coming back to you, helping people with your mission, helping people, you know, that connection piece and just the strategy that you bring to them and everyone else. So I'm really excited to hear more about this strategy. Uh, I know that you mentioned, you know, you've, you've got a lot of systems and processes around this. I know you are very organized and way on top of it, and I love it. So I'm going to let you jump back into back into this. I'm excited. Awesome. All right. So I am going to kind of broach it a bit with a question as we get started. Uh, once again, you're here, you're successful, there's no doubt about it. And if you have a high ticket offer, 
I can also pretty much guarantee that you are leaving profit in your list. You know, that's 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 kind of sometimes of what we think of is as doing business is that we especially for our operators, we develop our systems, we develop our strategies um, and at a certain point they end. You know, the, the, we run out of SOPs, we run out of systems as to what to do with those people on our list if they've perhaps never really responded beyond that initial lead magnet. Um, or maybe they got all the way through a sales call, but they said no. And then, like, what do you do with them? What's what's in your operational manual to, for what to do with those folks? And um, in the in the group that I work with on this, um, I can say that only once ever have we found an offer owner that had it so dialed in that there was no place we could help them. And so that's just kind of give you the scope here is that most people really, if you have a high ticket offer, can benefit from this strategy. And so, um, you know, it, it's it's a little bit of a, a humbling moment, perhaps, um, but that's what's exciting about this strategy is that it gives you a whole new opportunity to have a wave of, of profit, essentially, because more than likely with the systems that you have, you've made it profitable for yourself. You're covering your KPIs, you have your cost per acquisition, you know your average order value, like you have all the big acronyms. And so what's amazing about this is that it comes in and it's like this whole new wave of almost profit at that point. Uh, and so that's what makes this exciting because then you can do like you can decide, do you, you take that home and, and do something with your family? Do you feed that back into more leads, which then causes, you know, that, that amazing exponential growth once you, once you have this on the back end. And so of course, you know, you get to decide with that, but that's, that's a big part of the joy here is it's something that I like to refer to it as the back end of your back end, <laughs> essentially, uh, because uh, all of that stuff that's already in place you don't have to touch it. Like it all of not, you have to revise none of your SOPs. You have to revise none of your systems because it just comes in and get, attaches to the back end. Uh, and so that's another thing that's operators. <laughs> I understand that's going to make you feel better. Uh, and, and so uh, let's dive into it a little bit more. Yes. I mean, I'm just going to say like, this sounds like it's really good for everyone. Like, uh, and especially like, you know, for operators, like you're saying, like to not have to change up your systems and processes, but to add on something that's already, you know, ready to go, that is going to help you optimize because man, going into businesses and like teams and stuff like that, trying to change things around is not the most fun thing to do. It is no. incredibly difficult. Nobody wants to jump on. It's, it's hard. So having something that, you know, is proven to optimize for them and it's not, you know, changing how they currently operate so that they can just jump in and roll with it is awesome. So I'm really excited for this. It sounds like it's good for everybody, but like who, who is it really best for? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So uh, I kind of break this into two sections. So let's start with the kind of the, the top tier one, uh, which has to do with mindset and personality. Of course, you know, you're here, you're ready to learn because you have a growth mindset. You, you know, the idea of, of increasing what you know how to do to level up. Uh, you're excited about, oh, I can try this new thing. And so that, you know, that's the baseline is, is that you have that, that growth mindset. Um, and, and I'm going to push it a little bit because throughout this talk, we're going to, we're going to ask you to think about opportunities slightly differently. So, so keep that in your growth mindset mind. Um, and, uh, the way that I do this, my personal style of this, uh, is once again, exemplified by how I got into coffee accelerator way back in the day. Oh, I mean, it, it's only three years ago, but it feels like lifetime, so lifetime. many lifetimes, <laughs> time warp. Yeah. And, um, uh, I was I was looking at it, and uh, a mentor of mine had uh, had actually interviewed Stefan George, who was one of the the two main uh, co founders of it. And um, I just sent him a message saying, "Okay, tell me the real deal. You know, what's this guy really about?" And uh, this mentor replied, "Yeah, actually, he is. He's the he's the one we trust. We've sent people to him. They've learned a lot from him. And my favorite part was this line at the end that he wrote that said, "Not for novices." <laughs> So well, at that point, I had avoided marketing in my career like the plague. Oh. <laughs> I was either in education or I was in operations. And so I was like, well, I'm about as green as they get. But here's the thing. I also am stubborn and have tenacity like nobody's business. 
And so I jumped in. And so for me, um, when I think about new ways of thinking or new opportunities, I often go back to that as an example. Um, and of course, everybody here has their own way of approaching that. No, not as not as many people are as much of a smiling bull as I am <laughs> in that regard. Everybody has their own flavor. Um, but just keep that in mind is once again, growth mindset at the foundation, but a little bit extra to really be able to rewire yourselves and, and think about new opportunities in a different way. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, uh, just know that this is a really high leverage play. You know, as I talked about, it's it's the back end of the back end that can really make an exponential growth for your time, for your profit, and also for your impact. Because of course, oftentimes with your your high ticket offer, it's it's the stuff that oftentimes you know they have maybe perhaps the most direct access to you. They get the most insider information, um, and so um, if you have a high ticket offer that let's say has room for ten, and your current systems and operations are getting you to five people. Um, just by doubling that, you know, in that sense, you are you are having more of an impact. You are changing more lives. Uh, and so in that way, it really is a high leverage play um, that goes back to really utilizing your assets to their st strongest and minimizing the risk on the back end. And then, of course, you know, mission. We, we talked a little bit about that with when we talked about impact. Um, and uh, <laughs> one of the things that I, I remember, I know, Michelle, you're, you're editing and revising your Rolodex to turn it into a website and I love that so much. And I remember the first time you gave us all a chance to like check in on our on our own entry to see what's going on. <laughs> in the description for me instead of like email list management or whatever, you're like mission driven. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> I'm very like, you know, this is like <laughs> So I loved that so much. It made me totally giggle. Uh, and so uh, this definitely is in that high leverage play. It is about really um, actualizing your mission to the fullest by, by making that capacity. And when we combine all that together around new thinking and high leverage and mission driven, all of these combined are something that I call the producer's mindset. I'll let that sink in for just a little bit. Producer's mindset. Now, admittedly, I'm a little bit biased because before the uh, before I started in direct response, I was an event coordinator. I was a pr uh, producer, <laughs> a production manager, things along those lines. So I, I love that term. But it is also the term that, you know, in the midst of putting on, let's say, an event, you, you have your timeline like and especially with timelines, an event dead like time doesn't change once you set that event date like you make it. <laughs> But there's no option to delay. Um, and so you have your timelines, you have your budgets, you have your lineup for whatever your content is. But a producer always has to be aware of how those are constantly changing. Like maybe one of your high level uh, names for your content has to drop out. Uh, maybe some big budget thing comes in that you weren't expecting. Um, maybe uh, something about your team's timeline makes a shift. And it's, it's, it's this idea of, you know, for the operators, it's the idea of navigating that that constant changes. And for the visionaries, it's really relying perhaps on those relationships and those that creativity that drives the whole operation um, in, in this really fluid way. And so that's, that's what, what I refer to when I talk about a producer's mindset. And it's, it's uh, very different than, definitely it's different than an employee. Um, I haven't been an employee in over 10 years. Uh, I've been a, you know, a freelance contractor. <clears throat> and now with, with what I do with high ticket sales, I actually refer to myself as an investor. Um, and so this, this idea of, of producer um, is way above um, employee, way above freelancer. And at this pace of, of constantly watching, watching the movement. And so that's, that's the personality trait that, um, helps be able to see that this opportunity is actually an opportunity of found money. It is found money in the list. And that's, what's pretty exciting. I want that. Producers love that. <laughs> <laughs> we need that. <laughs> right. <laughs> I love this concept of the producer mindset too. Like, you know, it's a lot to manage and a lot to wrangle and, you know, getting things in line, having the timelines, you know, managing the team, the expectations, like not missing those deadlines. 
uh, it is, a, it is a mindset also being able to keep your cool under all of that and all of the changes like being able, it's, it is definitely a mindset and it's something that, you know, a lot of us have to work hard on. So yeah, I love that. And, and, you know, everybody needs some found money. Everybody needs some found money. Like that's, that's what we're here for. You know, that's what marketing is all about, you know? So I, I'm curious, like, how do you allocate assets for that found money? Like in the list and how do you, how do you find it? How do you allocate it? What does that look like for you? Totally. Yep. And so we talked about who is this best for, and we kind of went through the personality traits. And now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the business, kind of the actual like physical traits. And um, I love metaphors. Uh, so we're going to we're going to kind of carry our way through this with a metaphor. Um, and I also um, am, am very much into nature and the earth. So we're going to talk about a root vegetable because they're delicious. Uh, and they also have quite a few uh, traits that are similar to this, this high ticket offer and found money in the list. And so Michelle, tell me what your favorite root vegetable is. We got onions, we got potatoes, we got beets, we got parsnips, we got all kinds of options. Uh, what's one that you love? Give me all the things. Um, <laughs> beets. I make this bomb beet salad. I love beets. <laughs> mm, beets. Yes. Let's go with that red um, delicious, hearty, tastes like dirt beat. We love those. Those are awesome. Right, I don't, I don't think it tastes like dirt, but okay. <laughs> That's what I love about beets. It's like when I eat them, I'm like, oh, this tastes like dirt, like the minerals. I love the minerals. Wash them first. <laughs> what? You wash them first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got some, we got some beets. I even feel some, them. Some earthy beets. <laughs> All right, cool. So, so we got some beets. So with beets, you know, you you plant them. Uh, you put them in the ground. They grow their beautiful green tops, which if you don't know, you can eat those as well. They're delicious when you saute them. Um, you can eat, you know, including with like the red part of the beets, they go together really well, or you can do them separately. Anyway, they grow their beauty. like dirt? Sorry. <laughs> Not as much. More, <laughs> more like chard. More like chard. <laughs> chard dirt. All right. Sorry. I'll stop with this dirt thing. Okay. So we've got our lovely vegetables here. They're cooking in the, they're cooking up with the leaves. They're right. growing. We got this, we got this big red hard thing growing in the dirt that we don't really see yet, but we get around to the fall time. We pluck it out. Look at that thing. That's gorgeous. Uh, we chop off the greens so that we can put it now in our root cellar. So that was, you know, back in the day, the way that they preserved such things through the winter was our good old root cellar. Now we got way more fancy technology to do such things, but either way it is chilling somewhere cold just sitting there ready to be eaten. And so through the process that is direct response marketing, we just followed that situation. Though and those are all of those steps of harvesting that that beet are our KPIs. It is the cost per acquisition, it is the AOV. Um, you know, you've you've solved the problem with the unique solution. You planted that beet. Um, you have a list of low ticket buyers and flow of some kind. Uh, and that's that's the growing of it, that's the that's the potential of it, that's that beautiful green color of leaves. Um, you have an audience that loves you for it, for doing all of these things. Things. Um, and so that's that's a beautiful harvest is that that sense of of people are, are getting support and help and their lives are being impacted. And then you have this high ticket offer that sells, which is fantastic. Um, that's getting you all the things that you need to get you to the root seller. And that's keeping your business going. But then once again, we hit that gap where you perhaps have more capacity for high ticket sales than you're selling. Uh, and so this is this is where kind of the back end of the back end comes in is that we now need to figure out how to get that root vegetable out of the cellar into the plate. And so it is it is that delicious transformation that really happens at this point. And the 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 trick is is once again about how we're looking at our list. Um, and so this is this is where I, I want to just kind of brainstorm with you, Michelle, and and see where it goes for a little bit because when you you know you work with once again a lot of C-suite folks, you're you're looking at all kinds of elements of their business. And when you're talking with people, tell me some words about how people describe their list. So we're specifically talking like email list right now. Um, what are what are words people use to describe it? I mean, most recent, the most recently, especially with related to sales, is it's always they're not qualified, they're not qualified, blah blah blah. 
Um, so, you know, obviously the qualifier in the beginning, but it's usually like they're not qualified. They're not nurtured enough. They don't understand, you know, who you are in the product and, and, and getting to know the person the most. So I think those are probably the two biggest things that I hear from people. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. And so what's a great step here is that they already know that there's, there's something going on with that list. They, they know a key thing here, which is list does not, does not equal lead. They are not the same thing. And that is really important. Uh, And so I'm glad to hear that people are already uh, coming to that conclusion, but perhaps not that clearly articulated. Um, They're looking at, they're still looking at where's the problem. And they're looking at qualifications. They're looking at the nurture sequence. They're looking at things like that. Um, And that totally makes sense. And so as a result, perhaps they're busy spinning off new assets to try to better qualify or to nurture in a different way. And and, um, uh, what's interesting in that realm, too, is is where is that blend between logic and emotion? You know, as copywriters and direct response, we know emotion is is what drives that kind of that that push for for that directness of direct response. Um, And it's it's sometimes dialing in that more is actually something that we can do um, that is is unique and surprising with this back end of the back end. And that's why we actually don't touch anything at the beginning because whatever you're doing, great keep doing it because we approach how to qualify people. We approach how to nurture people. We approach how to uh, tap into their emotions uh, and also how to maximize existing assets in a different way. And so that's, <clears throat> that's, what's awesome about this, that, you know, as, as we looked at that, that root seller example, um, okay. So maybe people aren't as, as earthy based as I am. So let's talk football. Um, you notice I can't even like I don't even know the motion like it's not my thing <laughs> not mine either, so I'm, <laughs> I'm like oh, all right you can go down this path I don't know how helpful I'll be on this phone, but... <laughs> I'm trying to get different people's brains <laughs> that's what's catchy like, like that. <laughs> more like a tai chi move I don't know we're throwing beats guys we're throwing beats <laughs> oh, oh man <laughs> oh, let's say that it's like how you leverage <laughs> <laughs> how you're re-leveraging their assets, especially, you know, especially to really bring them into leads. So from a list to a lead. Exactly. And understanding that. So yeah, yep. I'm curious how you leverage those. It's because a lot of times, you know, with with their, especially because with high ticket sales, you don't need that many. Like, you know, once again, the example I gave, if your capacity is 10, you already have five, you only need five more. Yeah. You only need five more. So, so that's a big piece of this too. And so with what you have, perhaps um, offer owners have gotten people to, okay, here we go, football, uh, one yard line, you know, and you're, you're so, uh, so close. Like you just got, you just got to get that ball in somebody's hands, you know, three more feet. Um, and, and that's, uh, that's a really great place for this offer is uh, with the back end of the back end um, is because perhaps perhaps the list, at least those five people that you need are so much closer than perhaps that you that then you know. Uh, so once again, a root vegetable, it's time to eat it. It's time to turn this this list into a lead. Um, so the list sitting there, cool, literally cool in the root cellar, um, nutrients perhaps draining. Uh, maybe, and, and this is also where, you know, there is some truth to some people saying, you know, maybe it's just going to take like two years for this person to be ready. You know, I, uh, a, a, a great example of this is whenever like working with a preventative medicine, uh, like a functional doctor, let's say, you know, I'm, I'm 46. And so I just started hitting perimenopause and boy, howdy, that changes life in so many ways. <laughs> And I've been into health for a long time. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of things since I had a health crisis in my 20s. Um, and I knew about functional doctors. I knew they were important. I knew they were all about optimizing. But it literally wasn't until I started feeling the effects of perimenopause that I was like, okay, I need to do this. I need to do this. And so there, there is this aspect of, you know, do we just need to wait until they're ready? Um, and one of the beauties of 
this method, this, this high ticket sales method is that we can actually find out more about individuals to get them to realize, to realize the need before the, the intensity of the pain of, in this case, perimenopause. Um, and it, and it really just depends. Like I've never wanted kids ever in my life. And so thank goodness that never happened. Uh, but for some people, you could actually talk about how like your eggs are starting to deteriorate at whatever age, you know, and that, that's a very real thing for a lot of people. Um, or you can talk about, uh, you know, the, um, the, the aging process and, and, you know, have different elements about what really goes into that. For example, I remember when I was 25 and I had a very dear friend who was a nurse and I was just, I was just noticing that, you know, cuts and things weren't healing as fast. And she's like, well, how old are you again? 25. Oh, that's right. You stopped growing at 25. Mm. And I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> hadn't thought of it that way before. <laughs> And so with this, with this, this, this high ticket sales process, um, there is uh, one of the eyes gets us into the, the nitty gritty of all of that to, to get it so that rather than waiting two years for that person to be ready or for your nurturing or no like and trust to kick in, we could expedite that to the here and now. Um, and that's, that's potent for any business. Like if you think about, you know, the money that you can earn over a 10 year span, if you can push a chunk of that towards the beginning, you know, think about how you can infuse that into the business. Think about the impact you can have once again, you know, if once, if you're a functional doctor, the impact you can have on keeping people more healthy. Um, and, and, uh, that infusion is part of what we're doing with this process is bringing that closer to now instead of that that extended time that some people just accept as as part of the process. Uh, and so we're pushing that forward and getting us finally to where I'm going to talk about these three eyes. Because I've, I've almost tripped over myself being like, oh, don't say it yet, uh, because I want to make sure it goes in order so it makes sense for people, because I was jumping ahead to one of them in the middle. Um, but uh, I noticed that there is some typing action happening, and I don't know if this is the time to visit any of those, but this is the time where I think it makes sense to jump into the three eyes, but checking in with folks to see where we're at. Yeah, yeah. And I, I do, you know, I think like the time, like what you're talking about in terms of like the timeline and the age cycles and, and all of this really plays in into how you're kind of optimizing about to talk about the third eye huh <laughs> all right Isaac <laughs> I like my third eye but no <laughs> <laughs> no we're going to talk about the three eyes the number three <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the purple <laughs> chakra talk. <laughs> I am too. I mean, I'm all about that. A little purple flower on my head. All right. All right. Well, let's get into the three eyes. Let's get into the three eyes. Let's do it. I, I'm really curious about this. It's, this is really helpful. All right. Awesome. Glad to hear. So, you know, of course, one of the, the guiding principles in any kind of marketing conversation is the what's in it for me. You know, we always go back to that. Um, and, uh, it's, it's actually really interesting when I do the work that I do in regards to, um, earth relation, my earth relationship business, where there's a lot of push pull around that, uh, around, um, people not wanting to acknowledge that part of human nature. Uh, and so it's, it's interesting bringing that model into, into that part of my world. Um, and I actually give credit to this part of my world to helping me really understand the potency of that. Uh, and so what's in it for me, of course, the biggest aspect of that also both in the acronym, as well as the reality of that is the I, it is about the I, it is about that person. So, Hey, look at that. We got, we got eyes we can talk about. And I want you to know that, um, you know, I keep talking about the back end of the back end, and this is not something you can automatize just so you know, for your operators out there, um, it is a whole system that won't disrupt your flow, but there is an element of of connection that is required here. So I just want to make sure people know about that. Um, uh, and, and part of that is being able to give us an opportunity to look at angles and tactics in a different way. It is an opportunity to perhaps revive a product that's been sitting on the shelf. Um, there's the possibility of repackaging an offer, but we're figuring that out by being really, um, involved uh, at at key places in this process. And those those processes are where I labeled the eyes um, because they show the key places of of connection that has to happen. 
And so the very first one is what I call invitation. Um, there, um, and often this will happen through an email list, though there's lots of other ways. If you have Facebook groups, uh, you can even, uh, this is a really interesting way to do direct, uh, direct mail. Uh, I know we don't do that very often uh, as much anymore, like unless you're like, trying to get like the, you know, um, oh, what, what, uh, Carolyn, no, uh, what's her name? Who wrote the, um, the 50 year old white man's brain. Oh, uh, oh goodness. I love her so much. It's just, oh my gosh. Cole. Um, Isaac just wrote Cole. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And love her so much. And, um, you know, those kinds of folks, we know direct response works super, super well for. Um, but you can actually do it for a lot. Carolyn Cole? Yeah, it's something. She has two last names. Okay. If anybody remembers, please type it because I love her so much. And I, I feel awkward not remembering in the moment. And, um, and part of the reason I love her is because she's as animated as I am. <laughs> She's, she's up in your business. She's laughing with you. She's, she's a great time. Uh, and so I, I love her so much. Um, and she's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And so, um, once again, the whole point of this was, is that if you haven't used direct mail, this is actually a really interesting way that you can use direct mail as well. Uh, and, uh, Carolyn and Angela Cole, I, I don't know about yeah. that middle, middle last name, but yes, yes, it is something like that. Uh, yep. That's yep. cool. Awesome. And, um, and it's all about an invitation and this is different than traditional copy. Like we have several really good templates out there, you know, everything from, you know, Jeff Walker's product launch formula, which has a very templated approach about how you do the email sequence. Uh, we have amazing things like, um, PWAT, uh, that Jared Harlan devised. Uh, we have all kinds of, uh, amazing templates and formulas out there that have their set purpose. Like with, you're not going to use a product launch formula email sequence really anywhere else. PWAT is often really good for affiliate offers and churn and burn lists. Um, this is more about beginning and nurturing. It is about bringing together a connection between you and this person. And so it's actually much more structured as an invitation. Like, Hey, you want to come to my barbecue? You know, it's, it's, you want to, you want to, you know, hang out at the, the open mic with me. Um, you know, may, maybe it's more along the lines of the types of things that uh, Chris Haddad wrote for when he was talking about texting your ex back. It's about that invitation um, back into, or to give your, in, your attention back or to relook at a situation. Um, um, and the goal is that you're getting a hand raise. You know, we sometimes we talk about micro commitments in the realm of direct response marketing, definitely in the quiz funnel world. That's a huge um, concept that we work with. And uh, it is it is the goal to get your hand raised. And so there is this invitation that can, can work in a variety of settings. Um, but oftentimes the very first go of it, we often we call it a test because um, this is a, a type of investment and, and it's not guaranteed. You know, it, there is a risk to it. And so we often start with um, the play, the baseline place, which is the email list in this invitation. And then we get to the second I, which is the one I was about to talk about earlier, uh, which is intimacy. You know, a lot of times, especially those those people that perhaps you talked about, Michelle, that say they weren't nurtured enough, you know, and that that frustration as to how to do that. Well, a lot of times what we know is that boils down to people's thoughts of will this work for me? You know, I I constantly have uh, have that in my world because I my world breaks so so many rules <laughs> in so many ways. And so I'm, I'm constantly thinking in that way of, of, will this work for me? And, and our audience is, is really no different. Um, even if where, where that question comes from, comes from a variety of different places. Maybe it is uh, truly because they're unicorns like me. And perhaps it's because of, you know, um, uh, disbelief in themselves um, or um, uh, employee mindset, or, you know, there's a whole bunch of reasons why that can happen. Um, but this intimacy of this process really focuses on that and answers that question for people. And we really dig into the desired result people have. Um, we all know that really nobody is buying your high ticket offer. Nobody. They want the result. We know this. And this process of, of this attached back end high ticket sales process really allows us to dig into that. Um, and, and one of the things that I love about this is I'm somebody who's really pretty blunt and honest. And I love that with this process, I get to use that. 
we get to put it all on the table. And it is not through a phone call. It is not through Zoom. And, and that actually works to our benefit for a number of reasons. The first one being that as I'm asking questions and connecting with them in this virtual way, I'm kind of seen as a stranger that cares about them. And how much do we want that in our lives to just have somebody feel like they're listening to us, they're caring about us. And as a stranger, sometimes that is easier to admit some of the things that might be embarrassing about the situation, but it really allows us to dig deeper and really get to what's honest and really get to what's on the table. And I love that. I, I absolutely love that part of this process. And, um, and it, oh, I had another thought that went poof. Oh, another aspect of this is um, in that initial conversation we're having around intimacy, that invitation is often written from the offer owner's voice because it's on their list. And that's oftentimes the voice that's of the list. Um, and that very first one-on-one -on -one connection, we're, I'm totally honest and say, hey, offer owner is doing X, Y, and Z. So they're busy right now. Um, but this is Amber. I'm delighted to chat with you uh, about what you need. And in that moment, we learn a lot about people. Um, they'll either tell us something really negative or, oh yeah, I, I imagine that person's busy. So glad to talk with you, Amber. Um, or they um, are hoping something went wrong in the process and they're hoping to get retaliation. But what's really awesome about this, and I was actually talking about this with an offer owner earlier this week, is that it's a great way to, to weed out assholes, quite frankly weed out people that you don't even want in your group. <laughs> and that's a key piece. Like these high ticket programs, you want people that you're going to enjoy working with that are going to be good working together, especially if you have a community model of, of your group. Um, and so it's an amazing opportunity during this intimacy part to really weed out people in that regard. So we get to the honesty of it. And we also get to, um, do we, do we want this person really? And that gets us to the final I, which I refer to as initiation. And this is really where the transformation happens. Um, back when um, I was an event producer, I actually focused on a type of festival that was called a transformational festival. Um, many of you probably in this uh, Zoom room will know something called Burning Man. It's about to actually happen. Uh, people are starting to gather on the playa right now. Uh, and of the spectrum of variety of festivals, Burning Man is one uh, extreme of that spectrum. And it is this idea of you, you party hard, you have a great time, but you're also having all of these experiences that truly have the possibility of changing you. Like when you leave events like this, you are not the same person. And that's another aspect that I love about this model is that there truly is an initiation process of some kind that is involved in this transformation. And, um, and, and what's beautiful about that from the high ticket sales point of view and the found money point of view is that that's the moment of conversions. That is the moment of, oh, I see myself. And that's actually part of that, what you talked about with the qualification and the nurture is in those places where they didn't see themselves there yet, that initiation, that transformation happens in that moment. And it's all virtual. It's, it's really so amazing to take people through this process of the in, from the invitation to the intimacy to the initiation. It's, it's uh, uh, an incredible way of, of working with them. Once again, that doesn't change anything that you have before then. It is truly the back end of the back end. And, and I just, and I love that. And then that's, that actually kind of gets us to bonus I number four, uh, which is investment. Uh, you know, and this one, this one is less about the people you're trying to convert and more about you as an operator, you as a visionary, you as C-suite folks, you as offer owners, um, which is it goes back to the criteria we talked about at the beginning. It is about having that producer mindset and also being able to look at this root vegetable in a different way is that all of that work that you do doesn't mean Jack Diddley unless you get it on your plate, unless you have that beet salad, you know, and it goes back to this idea of found money and this idea that once again, your list is not your leads. There is a process needed to do that. And that is where the, the um, invitation, intimacy, and um, initiation comes in. And then, uh, you know, it's, it's also... Um, 
you know, this, this ability to uh, invest back into your, your customers, because once again, that's where you get to have, I guess you could say the, the fifth eye, which is impact, you know, uh, kind of looking at investment and impact in, in a side-by-side -side place uh, in this regard, uh, that the, the investment, it goes into your customers, the investment, it goes back into your business, which has an impact on both of those things. And that of course, brings us back to the vision or the mission aspect, which is, is the full circle of where we started. And, and so many pieces of this, I've talked about why I love it from the honesty, um, to the transformation. Um, but really in all of that is that idea of, of mission and going back to that and, and really wanting to have an impact on the world in regards to what you're doing. And, and just, you know, acknowledging that, um, of, of all the choices of things that you have to do, uh, you know, there at, in direct response, there can be a lot of, you know, shiny things all over the place. Um, and maybe there's, you know, a thousand and one things to do. Uh, and I'm sure Michelle, you've talked about this with visionaries in particular, um, as to like, you know, focus in on, I, you know, I, I don't know, is it three? Is it three things that you can maybe do like really, really well when it comes to it? Maybe one. But <laughs> I got, I got this. Uh, I got actually got this advice from uh, NHB, and that was that uh, it was Dale John's call. Is he what he does to help with the shiny ball syndrome? Is he allows himself to chase some of the some of the projects and things that he wants to do? He allows himself to do all of them, but then uh, a few times a year he sits down and he just brutally cuts out anything that's not mm -hmm. with the core ideal uh, main model of what's working. And, uh, and that helps him kind of help that shiny ball and be able to focus on a few, I wouldn't say more than three, I'm, I'm one to try five at least, but you know, <laughs> three I think is appropriate. One is what most people say you should do, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's one way to do it. But I do want to mention is like, you know, you've said this a few times is, is really like the way that you approach this is really interesting because it's not, it's not having to do a phone call. It's not having to do a zoom call. It's a lot lower commitment for people. So you you're sending, basically you're sending out an email, inviting them to this conversation. Mm -hmm. And then you're having kind of the more intimate details discussing, you know, their needs, they're able, they, they're not having this, you know, one-on-one -on -one visual face conversation i'm assuming it's over chat or messenger or something like that yeah it depends on the medium like you know we talked about that there's some people have facebook groups some people have the email list some people have the direct mail the direct mail tends to be kind of an instigator oh hey there's another eye um of of those um technology related pieces it's like if you send out you know something via chat or something via email what happens if something shows up in their mailbox two days later and so it tends to kind of bolt Bolster, um, those other virtual ways of doing things. Oh, I love that. I love that. That's smart. So you can hit them at multiple angles and still start this conversation because you're getting a lot more intimate details, like you said, because you're having this kind of conversation and you can hold a lot more of these conversations at once instead of, you know, dedicating a certain amount of time and feeling that overwhelmingly pushy sales call that can sometimes really get under people's skin. You're getting people who are aligning with what you want, especially if you only have 10 spots, you want somebody who's going to commit to that, not because they felt forced into it, but because they align with your mission, they align with, you know, your initiation process and everything that you have worked through to get them to the ideal customer that they are and bring them in in that way. So I guess my, I, my other question about this is, is really like, how do you find the, like, who, who do you normally use for this? Like you won't want, you don't want to use just any setter. Like they need to obviously align with your mission. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. How do you approach that side of it? Yeah. So basically you're asking like, who do you, who do you bring onto your team to do this? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, honestly, that's what I do now uh, within the, the marketing realm that that is what I do. That's what I focus on. Um, Cause my, you know, since, since that time um, of, of being, you know, poolsided with you, which I, at that point I was actually a year into uh, my copywriting business. Um, you know, I, I've done a couple iterations. I focused a lot on quiz funnels for a while. I cop I focused a lot on email list management. I also ended up doing this amazing thing that I loved that I referred to as brand response marketing. And I really just found that this process was the highest leverage play that I could help people with. Mm -hmm. 
um, for all the reasons that I listed. I, I just, I, I love it. I love the process of it. Um, and it, it really helps people. Um, so uh, it is something that I do for offer owners. I love doing it. It does require a, a, an in-depth conversation for sure. We really review those criteria, specifically those, those uh, what are called more physical traits about your business. Um, to make sure that you're you're ready for this investment, um, and and that's that's a bit I could also say selfish on my part in the sense that I'm investing, you know, the copy, I'm investing the the team, I'm investing my time, I'm investing if we do direct mail the postage, I'm investing in all of the management. So literally, the offer owner does nothing but deliver. The program to more people. Um, and I bring in everything as an investment um, and there's no upfront cost to the offer owner whatsoever. Um, and it's all rev share as a result. And so um, the, the biggest piece is to just re get really clear on um, if, if the business fully has those, those criteria that we talked about, because then you're ready for this. Um, and if not, cool, you know, get there, get to that point uh, and continue to build the business um, until you're ready to, to press go on that. I love that. I love that. And I feel like a lot of your copywriting training has also kind of, this helps with that is that like you're, you're doing a lot of research, like all these aspects, the quiz funnels, the email list management, these conversations, this is, you know, all research on the brand, the voice, what people want, how to talk to your customers. So you're getting to be able to deliver more of that information for the client as well, so that they can really optimize how they're speaking to their customers, who their customers are and all of that. Um, but then you're also helping them, you know, bring in, be bring in that found money. You're helping them bring in that found money and it's not costing up front. It's costing for, you know, the percentage of it, which keeps you more interested in or not interested in, but like more motivated to continue the continue the more sales. But I think like in the big picture for the offer owner or the business is it's, it's just really valuable to know these details about your customer. And you're never going to get this information until you have these conversations and you get these intimate details. And then, you know, it, it spurs off, you know, other products you can create, other ideas and different things like that, uh, that just help your audience. I think that's, you know, one of the key things is, is we're here to help people and we're here to connect. Um, and in order to, you know, I guess in order to help people, you do have to connect. And this is a great way for them to, or for, for you to be able to connect with the customers um, and help them out. So yeah, 100%. Yeah, this is interesting. 100%. Very cool. And, and with that, that's uh, all, honestly, actually, the, the, this, this method of high ticket sales can be just the beginning. Uh, you know, if the investment works out for both sides of the equation, there's actually so many other things that we can do at that point um, to, to continue to grow, to continue to look at other partnerships. Um, but it really all starts with that test because we'll have a conversation, of course, look at those criteria. Are they in place? Does it make sense? Um, it takes about an hour of onboarding to onboard me. So it's, it's not long at all um, to be able to just get ready for that first test. Uh, and then from there, you know, Know, we we see how it goes, and then all of those potentials that you talked about uh, are possible at that point, uh, and even beyond. And and uh, there was something else there that I wanted to highlight, which is another powerful aspect for this that operators. Once again, I know your brains are going to be like, "Oh, that's awesome." Uh, is um, normally in traditional, you know, phone sales, a that phone salesperson is not doing that that process of turning leads or list into leads. They're only getting leads and you know it's it's different levels of qualification at that point. So for example, that's that's part of what's great about this process is that I'm not, you know, sending one email and sending like a wave of 200 who knows at what level of qualified to your to your phone sales team uh, and them getting inundated and who knows what the quality actually is. Um, and so I, I'm not doing that. Um, it is already a process of starting to qualify people from the beginning. Um, and then what is awesome actually is that how 200, you know, hand raisers would overwhelm phone salespeople. Um, I can do that because it's all virtual. Like I can, I can be in communication with like a hundred people a day and begin that weeding out process um, because of how this works. And so it's, um, it gets us that much more research because we're talking to that many more people and also really gets us to, to that point of, of figuring out who is actually a, a lead in that regard. Yeah, I think that's huge. I think that's huge. It's like turning the list into leads and it's not, it's not even just like the immediate use of turning them into leads. It's, it's the long 
long term, like you're talking about, like maybe they're not ready today. Maybe they're ready in two years, but you're getting them. Thank you. Or not hopefully not two years. Let's move that up to like six months or less. Uh, but you're getting them thinking about it. And you're also getting the information that you need, the ideas that you need to keep them nurtured and to get them to educated to a point where they're ready to make that investment, um, you know, and they're ready to move forward with, you know, the process. Because a lot of people, what I see, especially with high ticket sales is they're like, yep, I have this one ten thousand dollar program and that's it that's all i've got mm -hmm. and and the only thing that i see with that is like there is a point where you i feel that you it, it's helpful to have some smaller ticket products and ways for them to get to know you better to understand your work and to kind of slowly move into that place where they can do the ten thousand. because yeah. like for me there's a lot of people i'm not going to jump into just every program that's just only this ten thousand dollar program i like to invest and in see make sure i align with the person and what i'm going to do and what they offer and how they deliver it so i think there's you know there's also that opportunity where you're able to help them find these lower level or these lower ticket um products and create those as well because you're getting that kind of feedback that they need so um i really like this way i like this method uh especially you know the, everything through chat and everything although i will admit i am just so so over chat right now <laughs> it gets tiring but if this is what i mean you're you're good at it this is what you do and you get a, you do get a lot of really good information for people and you're able really? to share those intimate details so I mean, I think this is really impressive. I think it's cool and something that a lot of, you know, people could really utilize. I do want to ask you. There is oh. a piece that I just want to hit on about what you said uh, just a little bit ago about that idea of feeding that information back into low ticket sales. Because so to begin this process, you need at least one. You need at least one low ticket offer that's converting. Um, and that and that might be part of the issue that we actually get to discover is that in your business, you have found this one way to get people in and it's working. I mean, you're making sales, both low ticket and high ticket, but that's where we find is actually the gap between, you know, having half of the high ticket program sold and the whole thing is through these intimate conversations, I'm discovering what those other potential two angles are that are going to be successful as a whole. And then that's where we can then create a, a suite of low ticket offers. And maybe it's those three different angles. Um, and so that's, um, you need to at least have one already dialed in, but the beauty is that we get to, through this process, we get to flush it out a little bit more um, to, to have more of that, to fill that gap essentially. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's like funding this process on top of it. Like it's funding the ability to create and deliver the, the high ticket. And, you know, a, a lot of offer owners just get really stuck on like, no, this is my high ticket. I have to sell all of these. And yeah, that's incredibly important, but getting them to the place that they're ready for that is also important. So like you're talking about is just the progressive timeline and how you're, you're helping them get to this point. Um, you know, through your three eyes, well, four or five that we've talked about so far. <laughs> we, added a few. <laughs> <laughs> we like to talk about eyes. I... <laughs> this eye, no. This eye. These this eyes. Eye. The purple eye. All the eyes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but really it's you know it's it's the long-term value of them and it's a long you know the the value of what you're delivering to and the impact of what you're delivering um one of the books i've read recently is you know your income is directly related to the impact and influence that you can deliver and the way that you can help other people you're the more help you the more you can help other people and the more people that you can help you know the higher your influence and impact uh can totally. be Totally, uh, yeah. and your income, you know, yep. but I, I do want to, first, I want to, you know, I want to ask you a couple of questions. We're going to do a little bit of a reverse question this, this time. Um, but I also want to make a note that I really want to hear more about the earth relationship. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, mm -hmm. do you want to tell us a little about that before we jump into these reverse questions? Or do you want Let's to do the reverse questions first, because that will that will circle that aspect. And then <laughs> the earth relationship can be the back end of the back end. <laughs> I love it. Back end is back end. I'm all about that. All right. I'm going to stop being a weirdo now. Uh, <laughs> There's all kinds of metaphors that could go there. I'll let your brains have at it. Yep. Just know that it's good. <laughs> back end? No, I'm kidding. All right. Sorry. I shouldn't have props around me. I'm like a little 13 year old boy. Oh, well, uh, props. <laughs> All so right, first Q&A looks like me being in control of the questions. Uh, and because, you know, I what my my first career as a public school teacher. So I, I love me some questions. 
Um, and, uh, and what I would like to do is it could be you, Michelle, it could be somebody who's willing to just raise their hand, uh, it, wherever all the people are, the Facebooks, the Zooms, the wherever. Um, and I'm going to ask you two questions, uh, and then I'll allow you to ask whatever question you have, but first to earn it, you gotta, you gotta, I gotta, I'm going to ask you two questions. So who is, who's willing to do that? I know Isaac's going to raise his hand. <laughs> Come on, Isaac. We're counting on you, boy. How are you? Where's your third eye? No, now he gets quiet. Okay, now, all right. How about I go first? Taking a bio break. Anybody else? Anybody, else? Anybody want to go first? Do you want? Oh, the, I, I put the challenge down and people go quiet. Look at that. Mm -hmm. you know you, I, maybe, maybe. I, I can jump in. Writers, copyright. Oh, there's Robin. Sure. Yeah. Hi. Hey, Amber, Michelle. I've been here. I've been here. <laughs> I'm Robin and I on also very, go very way, back. way, way back. I know. I love how we cross paths at totally. key moments. It's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Robin so and I, I think I was already in Copy Accelerator, but you were not. And I wasn't. Some... And what you described was exactly what happened to me afterwards. I was sitting at a table with you, who I had met just a little earlier, uh, a few months earlier at a Copy Accelerator event. And I had that same pull and that same, you know, I, I, I was thinking of it today, how you must have looked at me with those observing, knowing eyes. You know, you knew the pitch that was coming and I was just doe-eyed walking into this <laughs> direct response world and i actually my memory is that i warned you i'm like the pitch is coming you and did to, yes and you just, did you know i'm me. actually part of it because there stefan had planted a couple of us and i was one of the plants uh oh, to talk about our story and i'm like just so you know this is about to happen and you're sitting yeah. next to part of this <laughs> but do it if it's right for you and i'm glad yeah. that you said that's yes. so interesting the out. plants because <laughs> Because now we cross paths again. Because Michelle, I'm, I'm also getting into this this high ticket back end world. So you know, some I'm I've been <laughs> tiptoeing behind, falling amber right at these key moments. Uh, so that's why it's really fascinating for me to listen, because it's a little tricky at times to put it into words. Mm -hmm into simple words, into short, simple, concise words. Imagery works well, analogies, and I keep trying to come up with new ones, good ones, or when I'm talking with people. So yeah, very good to hear you. And it's back to that that high ticket thing that, you know, Stefan up on stage and that kind of thing, you know, what what speaks down into the, the heart, the core of, of people. And but what's you know what's lovely about this approach is it's it's not just it's not just one power packed speech. It's not just right. one well orchestrated moment, um, which has its place. I I have a master's in theater production. I understand moments; <laughs> they're very important. Um, but I just love about that, you know as as I talked about is is this process we take people through in a very honest, genuine, intimate way, um, and that's that's how I love to roll in my life. Uh, and so um, that's that's what I love about this process is that it really is on you just it is it's just be who you are lay it on the table um and and let's 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 get you off the fence let's get you past that one yard line let's get that beat into the salad um, yes and, and let's make a difference yes absolutely it really is exciting the the tricky part for me now is the beginning is getting because first there's these offer owners these mm -hmm. those people to talk to before then can we can really do the work mm -hmm. so it's that initial there's a level of trust that needs to be established because they're kind of opening the door and come in here's my list do what you will <laughs> yeah so there's that that yeah. trust mm -hmm. somehow to to be to and be I think set. that's for me that's where the criteria comes in and where you know I get to be honest which is this will work for you at at this juncture of your business and if you're not there totally cool like if you mm -hmm. see yourself mm -hmm. there in six months awesome let's tuck in six months um or you know maybe I can give you some insights about this process so as you're building over these next six months it's it's in that direction and so um I I, I find it similar where it's just being honest about that criteria um you know it's, yeah and I love that because that's always worked for me, that sort of honesty thing. Mm -hmm. And and I mean it's 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 how I run my life now, these last five years or whatever. And and I've brought it into marketing conversations with new clients, whatever, and, and it always works well for me. It, yeah. Yeah, people are often 
not taken aback, but sort of like, oh, this is refreshing. Somebody who's just speaking their mind and truthfully and whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So it's my turn to ask you my two yes. questions. <laughs> you thought you were going to get out of that by just <laughs> chatting with me. I know how to track a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's not too hard. <laughs> it's, it's, this is, this is, this is butter on the toast. All right. So, I'll, uh, first question, tell me, so you, you kind of moved around in this world, but what is one succinct key takeaway that you got from this conversation? One succinct key takeaway I got from this conversation. Oh boy. Um, well, for me personally, it's this kind of, there's a lot more than meets the eye. You know, at the beginning, like, and that's what I'm getting into this world of, of kind of operating behind the scenes leverage here. There you go. If we had to put it in one word, mm -hmm. leverage, you know, yeah. how, because I've reached a point copywriting where I'm like, okay, I see kind of the max I can get to monthly. Uh, unless I'm just working around the clock. I don't want to do that. How can I, how can I tweak things? How can I get a lever to do a lot more than I am capable of just on my own? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Leverage is powerful. So you talked about this a little bit. You got into the second question, but I'm going to ask you to once again, narrow it in. And now that you know, now that you're taking in this, this leverage idea, how does that benefit you? Ah, uh, how does that benefit me? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, right. So, um, so to follow in from that first one, it's, uh, it, it increases, what I can do, how many people I can reach, and by default, how much money I can make. Um, you know, I can help more than just, you know, I'm used to doing client work. I do, I, I have a task, I do it, I give it in, I get money. Mm -hmm. But here I can, I, can, I can open that up into a more sort of a one-to-many sort mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, approach to it. So that's the benefit there. You know, I can reach more people. I can help more people. And with my goal of earning more, which is still like a very pressing goal for me where I am right now. But I know that, you know, I get there by helping more. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, it's not the make money thing that's going to, mm -hmm. well, maybe it'll help me make more money, but I won't be happy with it. But if I, if I, if I focus more on the helping more people, reaching more people, that will just flow naturally. So really leveraging your value. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's also something Robin, you, you touched on something that I think is also really important, which is, um, you know, uh, I, I, I am grateful for so many things that I got of CA. And one thing though, that I remember that I had to unlearn that I got from CA to be able to do this, this um, high ticket sales approach. I had to unlearn this that was planted in me in CA, which is uh, Stefan really focused on getting paid up front. Do not make your income of, as a copywriter based on the results of your, of your client. And that was really a strong part of his message. And, and, I, and I get why I get yeah. from like, you don't know if what, you know, there's so many things about that business that you can't control in regards to the power your copy will or will not have. So from that um, vantage point, I totally understand it. But that's why I'm now really honest that I'm saying, hey, I am investing in your company when I do this, because our results are tied together. And so that's that's a big that's a big leverage moment, but also a really you know strong stance to take that we're in this together, and and it actually puts us more in alignment because as a copywriter, especially let's say if you're on a retainer, it actually benefits the copywriter if they're continually needed and maybe still trying to iterate and find um, the results that are going to happen. It actually benefits a copywriter if they're constantly needed. Um, and, and, um, and so there's actually a little bit of opposition there. Um, and, and that, that is, you know, the opposition does have to do with, you know, Michelle, I'm sure you've seen this just like, there's so many operational aspects that copywriter just doesn't have control over. Um, but from this side, we're, we're walking in together saying we are investing in this together. Our results are going to hinge on one another. Um, and so that's, um, I think something really important in what you, you, you included in your answer there, Robin. 
I just want to say, I think that's a really important uh, distinction too, is just how you're basically creating another department and service that they can add on to what they're doing existing that is is helpful to both of you without having to stress about the upfront. Because a lot of times, you know, when you're writing copy or sales page or whatever, you don't always know that they're actually going to deliver it, that they're actually going to use it, all these, you know, pieces. So by creating an entire, you know, process that is easy, that they don't have to do much of the implementation, you are managing the implementation, you're making it easy for them. And your goal is really just to, to get them, you know, those, those spots filled for them and help them create more products, uh, get more high ticket sales, all of that, you're creating an all in one process and program for them to be able to utilize and bring in finances that help you and them. And then basing it off of that versus this upfront payment makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it just is ease for the business owner, and just more profit for both of you. And you're, you can always kind of gauge and, you know, relay your value of this program and this, you know, this addition that you are through the sales that you're bringing in. All right. So Robin, now that you've answered my two questions, voila, um, this is your opportunity if you want to ask me a direct question. Oh, my. Um, <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know that I have one because I don't think I really do. I just wanted to listen to you because I know what you're doing and I'm, you know, we're very closely aligned right now with this. Um, and it's still very fresh and new to me. Uh oh, did he freeze? So, you know, it's a it's a big shift from hiding behind my keyboard <laughs> to now I'm uh I'm doing this more, getting on calls with people and um putting into words, well, approaching it not from that point of view of you know, looking for a client and I hope they like me, but mm -hmm. from more from that that confident investor uh mindset. So that's that's a big part of of the shift that I'm struggling through at least. So um, I don't know, maybe, maybe um, what's helped you with that? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. And it's, it's something that um, uh, honestly, I, I um, coming into when I did come into copy accelerator, this was actually something I already had in my favor because I'd already been uh, a producer essentially for a decade. Mm -hmm when it came to event production. Um, and so one of the things that I noticed a lot of people were struggling with when they first joined CA was that idea of like, how do you, how do you have just honest conversations around a contract, you know, and who brings what to the table? Um, and for a lot of people, that's really hard, especially if they've only ever been an employee. And I already had 10 years of experience of those kinds of just conversations. Nice. Um, and, and I would say, in that process, the thing that I discovered about myself, and we, you know, we talk a lot about this in regards to, once again, investors, we talked about, you know, you minimize risk, you maximize results. And, um, you know, everybody has the upbringing that they have. Like I know, Robin, you've been very vocal about your, your sobriety. Um, and for me, uh, I come from a family of child abuse. Uh, and so there's, there's different things that we all have in our background that are part of what we're just dealing with on a personal level. And so you, what I found about myself is knowing what is it that I can, I absolutely cannot risk. What are the, what are the handful of things that are just completely off the table of risk? So for example, I'm a foster kid. That's part of my story. And so home is a really triggering, like just instant trigger issue. And so I made sure that um, no matter what I do, there is always some little chunk that will make sure rent is paid. And for a while, I was I, when I was an event coordinator, it was, I was actually a property manager. Uh, and that's uh, how I always made sure rent was paid. Um, now, uh, now that I'm working on this quiz funnel control, I have residuals that I'm getting that are making sure that rent is always paid. Um, and also the other thing that actually helped is two years ago, I got a car that I can live out of. And so if truly push comes to shove, I got my Honda <laughs> and it's awesome <laughs> and I can go travel. Great. Uh, and so what I found for me is, is what is it that I absolutely cannot risk because it'll make me lose who I am. It'll make me lose my ability to laugh. What's it'll that? make yeah. me lose my ability to be expressive. It'll make me lose my ability to be creative. Uh, and so that's what I found is that oftentimes in this employee mindset, so much seems to be at risk when really, if you boil it down, what are actually just like 
the five things that you just cannot risk. Thank you. Thank you. I love that. Yeah. That's huge. And creating that security, you know, and like that, that just knowing that that security is there and creating it, I think is just so massive for anybody in the kind of like freelance contractor space that we're in that a lot of people overlook is, you know, when you're in that space of always being afraid that you're not going to have the rent or you're not going to have this that, and the other to set up those kind of backup plans or those just backup thoughts, even if they're not actually going to happen, it makes you feel more safe and secure uh, and able to create more. That creative space is huge. And if you're in a scarcity mindset or afraid, uh, you're not going to in fear and in, in fear of, you know, your basic needs, you're not going to have as much bandwidth for what you really need. So that's really powerful. Thank you. Thanks for jumping on, Robin. Good to see you. Good to see you always. Yes. So Isaac has his hand raised, but he also said this is why he waited. I don't know. I'm not sure which moment was the reason he was waiting, but are you willing to come on now? Yeah, the I was ready to come on when you guys called me out. I just knew that if I got through the two questions, you would be asking me, what's your question? And I would be wondering what my question is, which is why I took a moment and now I have two. So awesome. we can, yeah. So if you want to do two, then one or four, then both, whatever, whatever's, whatever you're cool doing. Just asking my two questions and then letting you, letting you and I talk about purple chakras. Okay. Works for me. All right. <laughs> All right. So uh, the first one, uh, what is the key takeaway you got from this conversation? For me, that while the fundamentals change in terms of what they look like in their application, they don't really go away. So like what you were saying that mm -hmm. people get connected to, no, this is my high ticket offer. This is, it's this, it's this, it's this. Again, that's, it's the same thing as when you're working a day job and you're thinking, no, I need to make X amount of money. I need to make this, 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 or whatever it is. I think that it's funny that you were saying before how we, it needs to be in a visualization when we're talking about certain things, like a metaphor or so on. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest ones is mental blocks. Mm -hmm. And I think that the issue with that is what do you do with the block? You you go around it or you break it or whatever, but that's not how attitude, mindset, whatever you want to call it works. Mm -hmm. And the more I was thinking about it, I was thinking it's more like like mental tension because you can you can stretch a lot and you can be flexible, but that doesn't mean that one bad day after pulling a muscle, it's not still going to feel like that. Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking about how a business can think, oh, this is where I need to be, particularly when somebody's moving into a strategic role, mm -hmm. it can be easy to think, oh, well, they're making all this money. They, mm -hmm. they already have all the boxes ticked and so on. And there's probably a lot of boxes that are ticked where that's concerned, but it still makes sense to keep in mind what possibilities is somebody assuming are not available or where where are they going? Not because it's necessarily the most sensible, but because emotionally, maybe that's what they're inclined towards. So they want the person to go into the high ticket offer. But is that the path that makes the most sense mm -hmm. for the, the customer audience and so on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I'm, what I'm hearing there is... Um, uh, this process that I talked about is uh, reshaping the way that you see using fundamentals around high ticket sales and, and altering them a little bit. So like we talked, of course, like what's in it for me um, and those kind of, and you know, the emotional core and the logic just, you know, backs it up. So some of those things that we know are fundamental, um, but it's, I'm, I'm hearing you look at those in, in slightly different ways. Is, did I summarize correctly? Yeah. Cause we get into offer creation or copywriting or whatever, thinking, oh, I need to make this sound as good as possible. Possible, and then you realize, well, sound as good as possible to who you need to think about the audience first. But then once you're making a hundred thousand, a million, like whatever it is, it can be easy to just go, oh, but it needs to be the best thing possible. Again, the best thing possible for who. So it's easy to fall back into that same thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. I love that. And that's, that is part of, you know, the, the, you know, I've, I've heard this before where, where people like break down what goes into copy, like the research and the, you know, the, this is and that's and that really the words are like 10% of mm -hmm. it. It's, it's the icing on the cake. Um, and it's, it's really what's powerful about this process is it really dives deep into that intimate place with people. Um, and, and once again, goes to getting it, get, being honest about it. 
you know, being honest about what the person needs um, and being um, also honest if you even want them in the group, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, once again, I was talking with somebody who um, he is, he's a doctor. And um, he had just done a sleep program and he realized, oh my gosh, those people are really hard to work with because they're in, they're cranky because they can't sleep uh, and they want to message you at like two in the morning when they can't sleep. And like <laughs> He was like reeling from how tough that was. Uh, and so I said, yes, this, this process will we'll weed those people out for you. <laughs> <laughs> and and make it people that um that can benefit from what you're doing and also people that uh you know that you can help and want to help. Yeah. And it goes back to that that awareness again of what people do you want to work with. Yep. Because if you're thinking about the money first, which is it sounds somewhat like that high ticket obsession is with some people. It's like, well, I don't want, I don't want to get a $250 customer. I want a five thousand dollar customer or whatever it is. That's fine if that's your priority. But again, it's okay. So what does this $5,000 customer look like? Because if you're trying to turn a $250 customer into a $5,000 customer, in a certain way, you, you really can't. It's where where are they in their own journey that they're ready for this or so on. But it, you still have to come back to those questions that you have to ask. It can't just be well, I want to make 5,000 rather than 250 because that's not. Yeah. And that, that goes back to a conversation I was having with another offer owner is um, she was talking about how she had increased, she'd created this product so that she could increase it to X amount of dollars. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, who's it for? And she couldn't answer me. She literally just created it because, it, uh, because she thought she could get more money out of it. Uh, and so it, there is, there is a danger there for sure. Um, and, and that would be like going back to the criteria that I talk about at the beginning of like, you have an audience that loves you, um, and, and is, uh, is, is, um, ready for this, this program that you have for them. And we just got to help them see it. Cause she wasn't using her third eye to perceive <laughs> things. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So of all this gobbledygook, um, maybe we've touched on it, but can you concisely, and I know this is tough for you, Isaac, you'd like to talk, ramble, stream of consciousness, but can you concisely say what does that new information um, benefit you? I would say that concisely, it comes back to the fundamentals don't go away. They just change shape. Yeah. So that's, 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 a, that's, a re that's awesome. But how does that benefit you? What do you do with that? It benefits me by keeping in mind what the fundamentals what the fundamentals are as i go into something new mm -hmm. so maybe I, having like a sticky on your wall or on your desktop that's like oh yeah these five things right or a list of uh, principles whatever it obviously is going to change depending on the person but yeah right so as you experiment you continue to oh yeah touch that point oh yeah touch that point right nice cool all right, so, so your chance to ask questions now. Uh, okay, I thought you just asked me one question. Oh no, that was the second. That was takeaway gotcha. and benefit. Bada bing, well, bada boom. I, I forgot that one plus one equals two, rather than just two <laughs> questions. Uh, you know, copywriters, we know how to do. Uh, we know how to add up the amounts that we're getting paid and the amounts we need to pay other things, at least. Um, <laughs> Well, what will, what will happen when uh, Michelle and I talk about my earth relationship business is uh, I actually often work in the realm of emergence where one plus one equals three. Hey, I'm here for it. Awesome. So what do you got? Talk to me. So the first question is more of a client related question. I have another okay. one that's, that's related to my particular stuff, but okay. this one is my client has typically found that high ticket doesn't really work in i don't know if he if he said his industry but it hasn't worked for his audience releasing high ticket hasn't worked releasing to his audience and what i'm doing for him is not just writing copy it's building a division essentially and mm -hmm. so my responsibility is greater which also means what i'm thinking about it is strategically greater and so i'm thinking okay is it true that this audience doesn't respond to high ticket or is it that the high ticket has been pursued in a way which is not going to work because it, it can be easy to think of it that way. Is there no door in the wall or is somebody just trying to walk through the wall and saying there's no door, mm -hmm. you know? And if there is just the wall, then whatever, but I'd rather do my due diligence there. So I'm curious what your perspective is on finding an opportunity to bring a high ticket offer into a 
niche audience space, maybe is the best way to phrase it, that typically is not resonating with it. And if you need more context, I'm happy to explain, but I tend to no, I just need a little clarification. I don't need context. I just need, you okay. said, how do I bring in a high ticket offer that does not fit your needs? This is what I heard. So I'm thinking I got it wrong. So, so what I wrote down was how to bring high ticket into a niche that typically doesn't resonate with it was how I had written it down initially. Yeah, I would guess I would really challenge that word, that word resonate. Um, and this definitely okay. is a big part of what I do in my, my earth relationship business. I can tell you so many times, all the people that told me there's no way I can make it work. Um, because it is, it is uh, oftentimes in the realm of like the nonprofit world. Uh, and, um, and so it is, it is the, the challenge to the offer owner to be like, well, what, what is the actual impact here? So for example, with me, oftentimes when people think about climate, they think about led lights, solar panels, and bringing their grocery own grocery bags, to the grocery store. And the reality is that is not going to make a difference. Yes, it's important. Yes, we should do it. And, um, climate's coming. It's coming for us. And um, from my opinion, the issue really at hand is how do we fly together faster and how do we develop technologies of belonging and connection? Because really, the climate crisis is a human crisis. Uh, we, we have viewed things in a certain way for a certain amount of time that have got us to this point. And, um, and so what I'm looking at as I look at that is all of the people have told me it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> and talk about a niche audience, like uh, I, I got it there for sure. And the, the challenge then becomes knowing that this is such a big shift in how people think is it is it is once again digging into those angles. Um, and and I can uh, the the phrase technology of belonging and connection that alone is a great example, um, because when I talked about things before I had that phrase, people liked it, they were attracted to it, but they weren't quite they, they, they didn't have a place to file it in their brain to to quote unquote justify it. Um, but as soon as I brought that phrase technology of belonging and connection, instantly people are like, oh, I can put that there. Oh, I can make that there. Oh, it connects to that over there. Um, and it became uh, kind of this, this amazing, amazing change that happened. So part of it is continuing to really look at um, what, what is it that will, will really resonate with people, especially if what you're saying is that there's this niche audience that supposedly won't work with high ticket is, um, is uh, trying to figure out, well, well, why? And for me, from a climate perspective, it is often um, because the what is seen as the high ticket offers are those, those big um, solar arrays and air filters and things like that. Uh, and um, I know that coming in, the barrier that I immediately have is I'm gonna have to convince people, actually, it's about our mindsets, it's about where our hearts are at. And so that's why I used their term technology, but then gave them this whole like whiplash of connecting it to belonging and connection. And so just like, you know, when, when I asked you about your takeaway, um, you were like, okay, where's the, you know, let's look at the fundamentals. Those stay the same, but we have to be, we have to be willing to dance with them. We have to be fluid with them. Um, and, and, um, uh, that, that definitely is true in this realm of, of how, how do you catch couch something that is, um, deemed, um, not, not possible. Um, and it, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Like I've been working on this earth relationship thing for quite some time, uh, to continue to refine it and, and build it. And to me, it is so, it's, it's, it's so important that it's worth it. So that becomes a question too, for your offer owner is how important is it really, um, for them? What, how, what are they willing to work through to get to that? Um, I would say this particular producer mindset, um, and 3i strategy tends to work best for people that do have a high ticket offer that people are saying they got results from. Um, offer creation 
which it sounds like you're kind of in the realm of, is a whole nother aspect that could benefit from this process, especially if, you know, you're talking with people virtually, like a hundred of them at a time, you're going to maybe get faster to what are those needle movers or where are people's objections or where are people's stuck places. Um, in this language, we often talk about tapping people. Um, and each of those taps, we, we discover what's the next thing that pops up for people um, in regards to why they're not yet saying yes. Um, and so um, this process can be useful to, to get that information much, much, much more quickly um, and, and be able to help the person who's running that program to, draw, to connect the dots for people and help them see it in those conversations. And so there is a little bit of two different things going on here. There is um, this play that to truly like back end to the back end, like you do need to have one that's already working. Um, but if you don't, if you're still in that phase of offer creation, um, you can use this process to, to get um, much, much, much more clear on what people want and their objections and all those things um, to, to help translate um, something that potentially is deemed not possible. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, he does have a, a high ticket offer that's successful. I mean, it's it's not a violation of an, like an NDA to point out that, I mean, he he's been running this the thing for for years and if it wasn't making good money he wouldn't have but it's right. it's an event which is that they they go out to it's you know it's, it's called spy week the word person i'm talking about it's jason hansen with a spy briefing and that obviously is successful because he's still doing it so i guess it's probably some clarification that i need to get as well because i don't know if the success of this event is rooted to releasing it to say like the email list or if that's a, a separate way that he's getting those leads in because being able to evade being kidnapped is obviously going to be more valuable for somebody who's going to be sought after for kidnapping like a whether it's a ceo like somebody who has reason to believe that they would be kidnapped in a foreign country or so on and who has the budget to pay for it but at the same time i wonder if another kind of event would be Fievel, because it's already been proven that some segment of this audience will invest in a high ticket event, even if it's not seen necessarily as an event or something. So I guess that at least at least gives me a direction to go in based on what you said of what's already working. Yeah, yeah, totally. And um, and maybe there's there uh, uh, one of the possibilities here is. Um, you know, the the high level CEOs that people might want to kidnap definitely have those those awarenesses and resources to go to an uh, in-person event um but maybe there's a play for people that um they have the resources to pay for the program but not to travel and pay for the hotel and the airfare and all those kinds of things that are attached to that um and so maybe there's some kind of other audience here um like for example environmentalists fucking a we're targets um, and, and so maybe there's some play there, um, for people that can invest in the program, uh, and maybe have some extended time to do it, uh, you know, versus like a CEO, they want it now, they want to know what it is. They, they can plug it in, they can do it. They can afford the airfare, all those things. Um, but maybe there's another area of people that need it a little more extended and in a way that doesn't have those additional costs. So, so playing a little bit with that, I think could be an option. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's good for the the first question. Uh, for the second one is actually more related to something that I'd been working on for a while, which is rooted in. I'm trying to not go into Isaac mode with the explanation. For the background of this is basically I raised myself using fiction, so that's where I got my role models. It's where I learned my principles and so on, and I got through a lot of situations that a lot of other people see as the circumstances just define you. And I know from experience that it's it's possible to to have an impact on that. And I've already recorded all the content and so on, but there was something that I wanted to do with it to go beyond a course, because that's that's what I've been developing. It's about 80% done. And I've just been focusing on you know, the client work lately. But in terms of the thinking, I wanted to do a higher ticket version of it, which would be more one-on-one -on -one at some point, but it would be 
more tailored in that sense. And when I was listening to what you're saying about finding the right people and making sure that it's going to be the right fit and so on, sure, I don't want someone to do it for two weeks and then refund and so on. I, I get that. I also want to make sure that I am just going to be working with the person who's going to see it through in that sense. So I, I'm curious what you found holistically tends to be the kinds of qualities of people in different spaces who will see these things through regardless of whether it's, you know, say an environmentalist thing or a survivalist thing or you know, transforming your life through fiction or whatever kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're at, so the ask is you want to do one-on-one -on -one, um, and maybe have like a year long program. How long are you thinking? That was something that I I hadn't really decided on in that sense because I haven't done this before. So I'm not sure what. So I think that would be your, your biggest research forward okay. piece would be is, uh, for example, I've, I've done so much therapy in my life. Uh, and um, the, the one that I'm currently doing is a somatic practice. And we agreed to 12 sessions. That was that was the 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 focus of of our agreement, and yeah. and I knew with the reason I was going in for it, um, as well as all the many things I have going on in my life, um, that 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 made sense. Like we would we would get a good chunk of a process done, um, but I could also see the end of the tunnel, so to speak, especially if you're going into deep, deep core stuff like that. Um, I think from uh, there, there is a truth to seeing the end that I'm not just going to keep rehashing <laughs> over and over the same stuff. Um, and so I would say that's, that's probably your first place of research is, is timeline and what people um, want and expect uh, in that regard. Um, and then um, one of the things that we we talk about in this method um, that is an interesting uh, marketing trick um, is idea, the idea of um, membership versus financing. And so, um, you know, memberships, uh, kind of the stats are people stay for three months and they leave. Um, and, um, but what if, what if you already had a set amount in mind, um, that you wanted to charge for this and you said, um, this is, this is what, um, it, it's going to be. And this is, this is what it, it costs per month. And so it allows them kind of that, that drip opportunity. Um, and, and oftentimes that, that drip opportunity, that kind of financing will get people like 70 to 80% of, to see it through, like think mm. of, I think all four of us here that have talked so far have been in CA. Um, I did a pay in full, uh, because I did the math and I'm like, I'm going to save money that way. And I'm, 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 a, I'm a bull when I agree to do something. I, I never drop out like ever. Um, and so I, I did pay in full, but um, I, I know that probably the vast majority of people that did CA, particularly CA light, um, did the did the the financing option. And um, uh, I, I don't know the dropout rate, but I'm guessing it's very small. Um, and so um, part of that could be actually kind of a trick with how you do payments. Um, in regards to to keeping people um, in it, there there is a risk there, uh, for sure. Um, but uh, it could be one that could be interesting to experiment with and to see how that goes. Um, but yeah, when it comes to when it comes to some kind of therapeutic work like that, um, I think probably one of the things you'll want to make sure. And and I don't know what kind of coaching training or experience you have is that whenever you close a session, there needs to be some kind of sense of we did this, like we did something even in this 12, se uh, 12 session uh, series that I said I was doing right now, personally, um, some of them were really hard, like really, really hard. And what I relied on my facilitator to do was to get me back to it. Like I never plan anything after our sessions. Like I give myself the rest of the day already. Um, I know to do that. Um, but some of those places we go are really deep. Um, and I rely on the facilitator to at least get me back to a place of, okay, this is, okay, this is me. This is, I'm, I'm here. Um, and, oh, we, we did somehow move from A to B during the course of this session. Um, and, and she actually, my, my therapist actually struggled with that at the beginning. And I did think about quitting. Cause I'm like, Oh, I don't know if this is going to work. Um, and once she finally got to the point where at the end, we had this moment of, all right, this is, this is what happened. And this is what you can, you know, 
work on on your own until our next session um, that that it's interesting how powerful that can be in regards to um, keeping people motivated um, and seeing those those mini results. Right. Yeah, because it's it's funny for me in terms of my perspective on experience transformation and so on, because I've never been a therapist or so on, but I am an author. And people think it's the same thing with, with marketing. It's like, oh, you're not a psychologist. If, if you're a capable marketer, in a lot of ways, you know more about certain elements of psychology than many psychologists do functionally. And so it's there are different things to be found in different areas. And when I think of things as the author and also finding out how quickly cha- transformation can happen in, in a given moment, it makes me think about that vehicle of of how people do that. And so for a lot of people who do connect with, say, like a, a given fictional character in a show that they grew up watching or so on, they they obviously connect with that character for a reason, because it's not like they talk to that character. The character is it's a concept. Right. But they resonate with something that comes from that character. And there's something about that character that they wish they embodied or so on. And so my main focus, they're the main place I was coming from with that one-on-one kind of idea would be something in their life that they, it feels like it's impossible to change, but they desperately want to change it. And so I'm going to, I'm going to stop you here because you're, 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 you're you're spinning. Um, and, uh, I can guarantee you, you need to get more concise in what you're offering. Uh, and, and there's, uh, I think what you need to look for is, is where is that aha moment? So for example, when I planned this talk today, um, I kind of, I, I centered it around the aha moment of leads versus list and how those are different. Mm-hmm. And you are lost in the weeds right now on what your, your aha moment is. Um, you know, when it comes to copywriting, helping psychology, for sure. I mean, that's how um, text your ex back became a thing. Chris Haddad's like, hey, I know how to like use my language to convince people of things. How about if I use those same strategies to teach people to text those things and get their ex back? Like that's how that came to be. Um, and so um, there, there's truth there. Um, there's also potential truth in what you're saying. Like I was, I, I did theater. Theater is such deep psychology uh, in regards to everything from how we, how we decide what color we use in the lights to how an actor portrays a character. Like there's, there's truth to all of that, but you're, you're losing me in your just like kind of word vomit in regards to what's the aha moment that you can focus on. Um, and that's kind of going back to this idea of these, of these three eyes for a business that has successfully already created a high ticket offer. They've had, they found at least one of those moments. And one of those moments has proven successful and true for their audience. And the beauty of this ba- adding a back end to the back end is that we find three potential, you know, a couple of potential more. So we have more pathways in for people. Um, so start with one, like for me, earth relationship, technology is a belonging connection. I'm starting there. And in that process, I'll find more. Uh, and so, um, uh, I, I know it's, uh, I know that you are vor- v- verbose. What's the word I'm trying to say? Verbose. verbose. verbose that's the word. And, and I love that about you. Uh, and also um, give, give me an aha moment, give your potential customer an aha moment uh, that will, that will, they'll have that experience of, oh, you just transformed me already. What more could, what more could you transform um, if I said yes? Yeah, I think I think that's a really huge, uh, really powerful point. And it's just you know, we can, it's it's really like clarity is key, and coming from a place of just like clear, concise um, verbiage, like you have to have it clear in your mind in order to make it clear in other people's minds and help show them how you're going to help them. Um, so just having that clarity, and also just want to bring it back to your first question is. Um, uh, like Amber is saying, uh, you know, they have that, that client has a back end offer or an in-person high ticket offer. Uh, see if you can, uh, have some conversations with the people who enjoyed that, uh, experience, just like Amber's doing, uh, and, and get it, gain information from there. So it's, you know, really great research tool, uh, way to create the offers and, and get more insights from them. And then just really focus on the clarity and, and, and being clear and concise, like start, writing all this out, what helps me is I, I write everything out. I, bl- I blurb on my, like everything in my brain onto documents. 
And then until I get to the point where it's like, oh, okay, this makes sense. This is what I'm actually doing. This is what I'm actually saying. And I can write it in one sentence or three bullet points. And those three bullet points make absolute clear, concise sense to me. Um, and that I'm able to deliver that to somebody in a conversation and then be able to say, oh, I get it without having to explain further than that one sentence. Yeah, it is. It's, yeah, the clarity element is definitely what I have struggled with the most in that sense, because it, in my mind, the holistic element of it is, I think, what makes it difficult in that sense for me, because it applies to this, it applies to that. And yeah. That's, I think, where it becomes so easy to to tangle into something else, like a, like a plant growing roots. I'm saying I'm going this way, going that way, and going all those ways matters because that's what enables the single stem to grow up. Mm-hmm. But yeah, focusing on the roots when people are looking, want to see the stem, I suppose, is the issue. And in, in quiz funnel world, we talk about the difference between a Band-Aid and a cure. So um, a quiz funnel is designed to give people an aha moment of self-discovery um, that is really a Band-Aid. Like, what is your number one relationship killer? Uh, what is What type of business owner are you? You know, you're, you're getting this, this little ping of dopamine of discovering this thing about yourself, but really it's a Band-Aid. And then what we do on the end of that is we go, great, now you know this thing. Now let me tell you where you're going to screw up. And this is how I can help you with that. And that often leads to like a webinar or something like that. And so what is the aha band-aid you can give your people? So, okay. So it sounds like what I've been trying to do is that to make the aha moment, the ultimate transformation rather than that band-aid. And I've been giving those different details of how it could go wrong, which is okay. Yep. Cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Products of all this, how it can go off of how it can go wrong and all these other pieces, but start like, you know, start like Amber saying with that initial band-aid, that initial piece, getting the, getting the small wins is key. Like you get it just starting with a little piece of that. Yep. So and yeah. You know all of these things because you're the expert in it, but remember that that's going to be your job is to teach people those things. Uh, and take people through that experience right now with where they are at, you know, good old Eugene Schwartz, you know, problem aware, all the solution aware, all those things um, is, is where are your people at and um, start there, meet them there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Super helpful and super valuable. Thank you, Amber. And thank you, Isaac and Robin, everybody who's been on and sharing. I really appreciate this. This was an awesome call. Uh, learned a lot, a lot of great t- key takeaways. My goodness. I, t- I was taking notes. I was hoping it wasn't too loud on there, but I'm trying to like type as quietly as I can. Uh, but I've got a lot of great notes. So the three to five eyes, <laughs> but honestly, just all this was really, really useful. I love the path that you're going down, how you're helping people, uh, both in this marketing world, but also like we've talked about a few times is, you know, you do a lot of environmental work and I'd love to just hear a couple minutes on that. If you have a moment just to share about earth relationship, uh, and then anybody who's interested in more of any of this, you know, the sales, the marketing, the um, optimization of high ticket and otherwise uh, reach out to Amber over DM. Uh, but also, yeah, give me give me some earth stuff, girl. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you do want to talk more about this, as Michelle said, uh, send me a DM. Remind me that you were here because um, that will that will make it pop for me. Uh, and of course, I love Michelle. So anything attached to Michelle, I'm like, yes. Uh, and so uh, happy to talk more about this. Um, specifically, probably the first step is I would take you once again through those criteria. And um, we're like it too. What's in it for me? Okay, well, let's review the criteria for your situation. Uh, and then we'll go from there. Uh, but from earth relationship uh, standpoint, um, yeah, it's it's actually what brought me into this world of direct response in the first place. Back in 2018, um, I ran into something called Movie Maker Academy, which was three amazing humans who have been very successful in the docu-series world and distributing docu-series through direct response marketing. And um, it was at a time where I was uh, figuring out how to build a career around blending um, art and ecology. And me also going like, what does that even mean? Like, how does that, how does that become a career? What's going on there? Uh, and um, 
And it was fantastic. Uh, and um, I learned a lot, but I also had a lot of other opportunities popping. Like I did an incredible project in uh, 2019 with the Oregon Tourism Commission um, that was um, just so incredible. And, and things that were more around my event world uh, were popping. And so this kind of stayed on the back burner. And then, you know, when when a deadly virus infects the whole world, uh, you can't gather people anymore, <laughs> like live events. And so I was like, well, let's let's give this let's give this docu series a go. And uh, very quickly, I realized that it was um, the the marketing that I needed to learn. And so that's where the deep dive took me. And it's been through that process of of learning that and working for clients uh, and and making um, missions into reality, missions into impact. Uh, is where I learned more and more about how to shape uh, what I now refer to as earth relationship. And um, within that, I've developed um, a, a starting place of this three-step circle. Um, and I'm now currently working on, because it's it's really important that the, these three steps are just not round and round a merry-go-round, but a deepening spiral. And so I've identified the three steps and now I'm working on defining uh, the layers within the spiral. And, um, and those are where the technologies of belonging and connection come in. Uh, and those three steps in the circle are first, uh, you just have to acknowledge that earth is our home, full stop. There is no other, there is no Mars. There is no moon. Um, those are part of our universe. They affect our world. They affect our life here on, on planet Earth. Um, but Earth is our home. And until you can accept that, uh, you're, you're going to be struggling. Uh, and so it's it's that, but but it's also an acknowledgement that coming to that realization is a tiered process. Like maybe you begin where you just like to hike outdoors and you acknowledge it from that vantage point. Um, and then you start to realize, oh, food systems, oh, those are fucked up in the United States. Uh, and how do we look at that? Um, and then we look deeper and deeper and um, and those those directions often tend to get more and more indigenous in their style of understanding uh, our relationship as Earth as home. In fact, indigenous people often refer to as earth as our kin, there are our relations. Um, and then as we continue this circle of understanding, uh, we have to go into what is what is our skill set? What do we bring to that? Maybe our job is not to design the next solar panel or the next, um, like there's amazing work happening at the national level where they're developing the equivalent of GDP for the for nature and how to assess nature in regards to the health of our country. Uh, phenomenal work. That is not my place. I am an artist. I am an artist at heart. That's part of the reason I got into copywriting um, is I think in metaphors, I think in language, I think in um, patterns and emotions. Um, and so um, that is my skill set. Uh, and that's that's what I can bring. And, and that brings me back to the docu-series that I'm working on, which I actually have two projects uh, in the pipe at the moment. One is getting more of my attention. Uh, and that one is called Climate of Awe, A-W-E. And uh, it is um, going to be a 10 episode docu-series plus 20 hours of bonus footage that will be distributed through this direct response model. And I am really excited to break all of the rules there um, because normally this, this process is, is successful for health and wealth niches, which we know very well in this world. Um, and I'm going to prove that it can work in this world. And once I do open that up to other people that are doing film um, and, and film in this realm often is regulated to either festival or PBS, and that's about it. Um, maybe you get the breakaway here and there, like my octopus teacher or something like that. Um, but I'm going to give this whole new way of, of distributing um, uh, these messages. Um, and um, I'm really excited about that. The other one is much more mainstream, like working with a Netflix or a, a channel or some other thing like that. And it's kind of a reality TV show similar to like Queer Eye for the Climate kind of concept is, is the background of that. Uh, and so there we go. Earth is my home. Arts are my skill set. But I've acknowledged that there's actually kind of five different archetypes within that. And that is where the quiz funnel that I developed is, is people can go through that and hopefully have an aha of, oh, this is the strategies that I can bring that are needed in the world right now when it comes to climate. Um, and then finally, um, the third part of that is how do we work together uh, right now uh, and throughout the world? Uh, if we identify something as a difference, we often view it as a bad thing rather than actually it's a plus because then we can bring together our strengths in that regard. Of course, we have to be careful of our shadows because we all have those too. Um, but that's kind of where the idea of emergence comes in. One plus one actually equals three. 
uh, rather than just two, when we actually learn how to work together. And that's once again, where technologies of belonging and connection really come into play. How do we do that? How do we work across our differences um, to then once again, return to, oh, okay, well, we're different, but we both share this home that is earth. And I have this skill set I can offer and we can work together in this way. And we keep going around this circle um, through through the the stages of of getting to a regenerative sustainable future uh, and um that's kind of the 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 place that it is currently at uh and it's it's really exciting um the production schedule for climate of awe is set to uh film on location for 30 days in october 2024 so a little over a year away uh and uh i'd be also absolutely delighted to talk to anybody about that as well Heck yeah. Heck yeah. I think that's huge. And it's so valuable and important, especially, you know, just people understanding, like you're saying, like earth is our home. I, you know, a long, long time ago, this issue became politicized in a way that it never should have. And to that point, so many people still are not willing to, well, many have not yet admitted to the actual issue and the crisis that we have at hand, or they just, you know, my father, for example, still thinks, I've been around for a long time. This is normal. This will happen, blah, blah. And, you know, I, I've also talked to other people who feel, oh, I'm seeing these changes in the environment. I'm, sh I'm seeing all of these, you know, things happening that just aren't normal and that we're not used to. And until people really, you know, like, I, th I think it's beautiful that you are bringing your gifts, your art to be able to bring that connection to people to understand this is our home. This is not a political issue. This is a human issue. This is an environment crisis. This is a, a home crisis. This is this is everything. This is, you know, the air we breathe, the, the water we drink, the food we eat, the way that we treat the earth has to change. Um, and, you know, utilizing your art and your skills and your brain and just your way of being able to convey these really important, this really important information for people to really understand and realize it, I think is so valuable and so helpful. So thank you. Thank you so much for this. I definitely want to help in any way I can all about this. Love it. I'm also going to make an introduction to you, um, to a former client of mine who's done some, um, documentaries with this kind of stuff with celebrities and things like oh, that. Awesome. He's got a list of like half a million of people who would just love this. So I love I'll make that. that introduction. Um, and can I, can I interject two things about what you said that I would, I, I, I find these are amazing aha moments too, even for people, uh, like us that are already passionate about this is a, there is a Yale study that proves that 70% of Americans are some level of concerned. So the problem is, and this is part of the reason I'm going the film route, is that when you look at what is in the media, um, we might have some news around like the hurricane that's happening in California, the fires in Canada, fires in Maui, like all these things, we get the dystopia, um, but we don't get any real solutions to go with that, or we don't see it in our characters and our movies. We don't see it uh, in unscripted shows, once again, unless they're regulated to like festivals and PBS. Uh, and so um, uh, that's one of the things that Hollywood is actually working on. There was an incredible summit I got to go to this summer called Hollywood Climate Summit, where it's like looking at how do we how do we normalize this language? Because right now it's just not there. It's completely missing in our media in regards to just like characters and stories to go back to what Isaac said is like, how do we, how do we make it relatable through characters? Um, and so um, to start with 70% of people are concerned, but we think it's a much smaller number because it's not in the language. And so that's part of the reason I'm going this route is to create the language, create a talking point, create an aha that allows you to bring it up at a party, to, to bring it up to your neighborhood association, to bring it up to your family, whatever the story is that you have that and the places that you have the ability to make an impact. Um, and then the other piece is that I find a really interesting pl place of, um, once again, we talked about, you know, one plus one equals three in this place of working across differences as we often have in our mind a type of person who either we paint as doesn't care or denies or, you know, the, these negative words. And there is some truth to that. There is, you know, 30 percent of people that are do fit into that category. Um, but I think some of the really interesting places of crossing those divides right now is actually farmland. 
And mm -hmm. farmland tends to be more conservative. It tends to be um, more um, on the political spectrum that does view this as a political issue that might infringe on rights. Um, but one thing that farmers and ranchers are very clear about at this point is that they don't have enough water. Mm -hmm. Period. Mm -hmm. There's not enough water to grow their crops, to give their cattle, to have prairie grass uh, for their cattle to eat. Um, farmers have the upfront reality that is not splashy. It is not the hurricane. It is not the fire. It's not, you know, a headline that that um, can, you know, if it bleeds, it leads kind of situation. But farmers and ranchers are at the front line of understanding um, that we, we have a water crisis going on. Um, and so I just want to bring up that those are two amazing aha moments to bring up uh, because they do fight this narrative that we have to fight for this. Um, but it is, once again, bringing it back to what are the technologies of belonging and connection that we need um, to have these conversations. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think those are really incredible points. And especially like, you know, just bringing it around to like, the more you do talk to people, a lot of people do really connect and understand on this level. But I think there's also that point where like, a lot of people don't know what they can do. And they feel they, they you know, they've, they've heard the, the, imp the uh, carbon footprint imprint. Uh, print, you know, like that typical stuff that I think it was like the, the head of B BP or somebody brought that in to make people think it was them, which we yep. all know it's not our own carbon, you know, footprint. It's, it's a lot of things and it's understanding those it's things. The that systems. It's the systems we're in. Exactly. In yeah. And there are things that we can do as individuals, including, you know, voting with your dollars, where you spend your money, who, how you're utilizing it, you know, personal things you can do to like reduce, you know, in your own water usage and all of that. And, and just understanding these things, knowing that this is, this is a problem. Like you said, like the, the farmers, like actually experiencing it right now, like they, it, it's, it's just. I don't know. It, it's just something that really, it means a lot to me. I love that you're, you're doing this work. Uh, my girlfriend and I were just, we've been going back and forth about how we're going to be, you know, putting some of this work out there as well. It's just giving people solutions, talking about it more, normalizing the language, giving ideas and ways that you can help uh, and change things. That's, okay. that's all we can do. Amazing. I love it. I, I, I'll, I'll be excited to hear what you and you and your, uh, do you say friend or neighbor? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my friends. yeah, yeah. I'm excited to hear what you're, what you're up to on that. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. I'm really excited to see the docuseries. So definitely keep me in the loop on that and everything sure. else you're doing. Obviously I'm a big fan uh, and I watch it all. So I'll connect you with that, uh, that friend as well. Awesome. And awesome. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate this Amber. You're an amazing woman. Mm, I love you too, Michelle. So much. <laughs> Thank you for having me on and in your group. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I love this, this opportunity to bring the two worlds together um, because in my head, they do, they are, they, they are very connected. Uh, and so um, uh, it was, it was fun to have this moment to, to bring them together and, and show how, how, how these, these two things are moving in the same circle and how um, uh, I can, the, the, that 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 mission at the base of it all, whether it's high ticket sales um, or climate or docu series or, or whatever it is, um, it's about that investment in the mission, and and that's that's what I love. That's what carries me through all of this, um, and I look forward to the ongoing conversations with people. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Amber. Super inspiring. Very helpful conversation today. I really appreciate it. Anybody has questions or wants to talk to Amber further about this, Amber Peoples. Easy one to easy one to figure out when Michelle's not butchering it. Uh, <laughs> she'll be tagged in this too, so just reach out to her.